this lesson, we'll look at measuring the coefficient of consolidation, C sub V, directly from laboratory test data from a consolidation test. So we're assuming you put the load on the soil, you measure settlement versus time, and then you try and measure C sub V directly from those data. And uh, as you recall, the uh, relationship between uh, the average degree of consolidation U average and time factor T has been derived from Terzaghi's one dimensional consolidation theory. So we know the dimensionless relationship here between basically dimensionless settlement and dimensionless time. So what we're going to do is try and curve fit these theories, right, the theory for settlement versus time, to our laboratory test data. And once we've done that, we can figure out which C sub V value gives us that best curve fit. And what we'll do is use two different methods. One of them uses the logarithm of time right here. So we call this shape, it's a double curvature kind of shape. And the other one uses the square root of time where you get this initial linear portion right at the beginning. Um, you might be wondering why do we have two different methods. Um, if this is curve fitting, one method should work fine and then the other one should also fit. Well, it turns out that real data has some issues. It, it, real soil doesn't conform to Terzaghi's one-dimensional consolidation theory. And so we have to do some adjustments. And there are multiple theories. It's always good to use both of them to constrain the range of C sub V. So what we assume we know is the drainage path length for the laboratory test. Because we know how thick the specimen is, and we know whether it's double-drained or single-drained. If it's double drained, then the drainage path length is half the layer thickness because water can flow up or down. Uh, we know settlement versus time, and we know time. So when you apply the load, you have to start the clock, and then you're measuring time, and you know settlement versus time. What we want to find is C sub V. And it turns out, using consolidation theory, we will also get A sub V, the coefficient of compression or compressibility, and then hydraulic conductivity, too. You can measure hydraulic conductivity from the consolidation test. All right, so let's talk about some of the problems that we have. So first, when a load is applied, some false deformation happens. And what I mean by false deformation is that the dial gauge moves, but it's not because the soil moved, it's because other things move. Um, the worst form of false deformation is when the piston isn't quite seated properly into the top cap and you apply a load and the piston might settle your dial gauge picks up that settlement as being a uh, deformation that is actually not attributed to the soil. There's also compression of the porous stones and other uh, components that are part of the system. So basically, that all of that false deformation happens really quickly, like right when the load is applied. So what we do is we just always ignore the zero reading. Like, I know you can read the dial gauge right before you apply the load, but that's a completely meaningless number. You should never use it. Just throw it away because of this false deformation. And I see a lot of times where students have that zero reading in, as part of their data, and then you have to plot it on a log scale. But, of course, you can't plot zero on a log scale, so then they put 0.01 second or something. They do something. Just get rid of the zero reading. It's bad. Don't use it. Um, Okay, and then the other problem is the real soil has secondary compression. So if we come back up here to this plot, like let's look at this one in log scale. The uh, theory goes asymptotic to the 100% consolidation curve, uh, which is basically a horizontal line, but in real life there's secondary compression, so there continues to be settlement even after consolidation is finished. So for those reasons, we have these two methods. The first one is Hassan-Rande's logarithm of time method. And what we'll do is plot settlement versus time on a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. So this blue line would be the measurements from the laboratory data, maybe from an LVBT or maybe from a dial gauge. However you make the measurement, you get settlement versus time. All right, so the first thing is that uh, we have to get the zero reading. So here, let me zoom in a little bit on this. So I'm going I'm to walk you through the steps here. Draw settlement versus time with time on a log scale. We've already done that. Now let's get the zero. We're, we're going to try and infer what the real zero reading is by eliminating the false deformation. 
portion of the laboratory curve before approximately 60% consolidation has happened. And then you pick a time four times T1. That is, um, you know, this is T1, this line is just four times T1. And then you come in here and find the vertical separation between those two points, and we'll call them delta S. All right, now, as you recall, the beginning portion of the curve was linear if you plotted it in a logarithmic scale, which means that um, it's parabolic in arithmetic scale, and if you pick T1 and four times T1, you know, this distance here, delta S, you should go above T1 by that same distance, delta S, and you get the initial read, which is basically following a parabola. So S0 is at that point. It's along this dashed line right there. So that's the real zero read, which we didn't actually measure because of the false deformation. Uh, okay, now the next thing is you notice over here we've got the secondary compression happening. Um, Real soil just continues settling slowly over time, and it doesn't go horizontal, you know, like that, like the theory would predict. So we have to account for that in some way, and the way we do it is very basic and simplistic. You draw a line that's tangent to the secondary compression region, then you draw another line that's tangent through the steepest part of the consolidation curve. It's kind of an inflection point right there, and the intersection of those two lines happen at a time that we call TP or the end of primary consolidation. You might be wondering, like, why don't we call this T100? Well, technically, the theory predicts that an infinite amount of time is required for consolidation to finish. So T100 is infinity. TP is a little bit more vague. It's like the time at which primary consolidation is basically finished and the settlement is now being controlled by secondary compression. And so you come over here and you get S100. And um, now we have the initial settlement and the final settlement at the end of primary consolidation. And what we do then is linearly interpolate S50. That's at the midway point, right? Um, at 50% average degree of consolidation. You come over here and you find where it intersects the lab curve and then you come down. And we now have this lowercase t50. That's the amount of time it took to reach 50% average degree of consolidation. Okay, then what we're going to do, I'm going to come back up to this figure. Recall that this is this is purely theoretical, right? This is a theory line from Terzaghi's 1D consolidation theory. Well, what we have now is 50% consolidation. We'll come over here, look at the curve, we go up there. This number happens to be 0 0.197. So based on Terzaghi's consolidation theory, capital T50 is 0 0.197. And we can now use that to estimate C sub V. So let's see. There we go. We've come all the way down to here. Um, we know that the definition of time factor was equal to C sub V times T over H squared, where H, is the drain, H sub dr is the drainage path length. So what we'll do is invert that relationship for C sub V instead, because in this relationship, we're assuming we knew C sub V and we knew at the time we were interested in and the drainage path length that we wanted to compute time factor. Now it's the opposite thing. We know the time factor from Terzaghi's consolidation theory. We measured the time at 50% consolidation, and we know the drainage path length based on the specimen geometry, and we can calculate C sub V. And that capital T50 is 0 0.197. So that's where the curve matching comes in, and that's the theoretical value. So we now have computed C sub V. All right, then there's another method, Taylor's square root of time method. And what Taylor does here is plots on the x-axis the square root of time, and that's just on a linear scale, not a log scale, an arithmetic scale. And you plot the same data, right? You get this blue line, and that's our, our laboratory curve. Um, okay, and then you fit a line through the initially linear portion of the curve. So that green line right there is going through the linear portion. It, becomes nonlinear approximately to 60% with average degree of consolidation. Okay, and then what Taylor found is if you draw a second line that has a slope that's 15% less steep than the uh, first line, that intersects the lab curve at a point that is 90% average degree of consolidation. So you, you draw the second line, you know, this if this distance is X, 
at this little distance in there, 0.15x. And then you can come in here and you find the square root of t90, and then you can get the t90 value from that. All right, so, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, in order to get the initial reading, you have to backward extrapolate that green line to where it intersects 0 on the x-axis, and that's equal to s0. Uh, okay, and then we do C sub E using the same equation, except now we're using T90 instead of T50. And capital T90 is 0 0.848 based on Trisaghi's one dimensional consolidation theory. Now, one thing to note most soil specimens in consolidation tests are double drained. So the water can flow up from the middle and it can flow down from the middle and get into these porous stones that are connected to the reservoir as drainage boundaries. So in that case, the drainage path length is equal to half of the layer thickness. Um, a common mistake is that students use the layer thickness in their calculations instead of using the drainage path length. So always keep that in mind. All right, then once we've done our laboratory test, we can compute C sub V for each loading stage. So remember, we've done all this just for one stage. Usually at nine or 10 stages or maybe more than that. So here's a little table that I've set up where you might have the initial effective stress, final effective stress, final void ratios, you can calculate then the coefficient of compressibility, a sub v, right? It's delta e over delta sigma v prime, so it's easy to get that. Then you can get S0 and S100 after you've read them off of the chart. And from those settlement values, you can compute the heights, H0 and H100. What was the initial height? What was the final height at the end of primary consolidation? Okay, and then you can, using Casa Grande's and Taylor's method, you can put in the lowercase t50 and lowercase t90 values after plotting the data and reading them off the graph. And then you can calculate C sub v using uh, either t50 or t90 here. Uh, and I'm putting h0. Remember, h is the height of the specimen, so I'm multiplying by 0.5 for a drop double drainage here and then squaring it. Note that because you're squaring it, if you get the drainage path length wrong, it has a really big effect, like a factor of 4 effect on your computed C sub v. Alright, and then you can calculate hydraulic conductivity as well. And the way you do that is to go back to our fundamental definition of C sub V. Another thing that's often confusing for students is that when we calculate C sub V for lab testing, we're actually using the fundamental definition of time factor, right? Big T is equal to C sub V times lowercase t over HDR squared. That was not our fundamental definition of C sub V, right? We've inverted it, so C sub V is then equal to big T HDR squared over lowercase t. That's like an inversion of the time factor equation. What we can do is go back to our fundamental definition of C sub V that came out of the solution to the differential equation, and then we can solve for hydraulic conductivity, K. C sub V depended on K, A sub V, and void ratio. So K is equal to C sub V gamma W, A sub V over 1 plus E, and we have all of those things computed now, so we can get hydraulic conductivity. Then the last thing we do, we already know how to plot this consolidation curve, right? E versus log sigma V prime. Well, now we can do two more curves. We can come in and get C sub V versus log sigma V prime, and we can get E versus log K. And I like to plot them exactly as they're shown here, where you come up and notice that you're computing C sub V for a load stage. These data points in the consolidation curve are at the end of the load stage. So what I like to do is plot them in the middle of the load stage. Right? So you come down there, and there's that point for that C sub V. Like this would be load stage 1, load stage 2. Notice that you can't get C sub V for load stage 1 because you don't know the initial effective stress. You can only get it for load stage 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 in this case. So what I'm doing is using red lines to extend down the plot points for load stages that were over-consolidated. Right, sigma p prime is somewhere around that point. So I'm calling these first two load stages over consolidated. Then we've turned the corner, we're going along C sub C. So now I'm going to plot those with blue triangles instead of red. Come down here like that. Then we unload for two stages. And again, I'm plotting those as red because they're also both over consolidated. And what you'll find, if you don't separate them or plot different symbols for over consolidated and normally consolidated, you won't really see a trend. It's not going to make a lot of sense to you. If you do separate these out, you'll clearly see that there are two different trends. One for the normally consolidated soil that's lower, 
strongly influenced by the over-consolidation ratio. So C sub C is about 5 to 20 times C sub R. A sub V varies a lot. C sub V is linearly inversely proportional to A sub V. Therefore, we get different relationships for over-consolidated and normally consolidated. Um, then we look at E versus log K, and we have uh, basically a linear relationship here. All of the point, it doesn't really matter if you're over-consolidated or normally consolidated. The lines are all, you know, the points are all going to line up kind of on a line. And then you can fit a line through that. And the slope of that line is C sub K, the coefficient of permeability variation. So that's pretty much it. Once you've gotten to this point, you're done with the lab testing part. And in the next lesson, I'll show you how to use these C sub V and K values in our field calculations.